I've got a play here that I thought was really interesting that I think illustrates a lot about the win condition of a game and how something like getting splatted can in some rare instances potentially be beneficial. Um, what I'm going to show you here is a play that I made in a Rainmaker match. This is at X rank. Um, and as you can see, I'm super jumping in after having gone down. A teammate is down in front of us. We have two members and they have all four clustered on that left hand side, getting ready to push the Rainmaker and try to go for checkpoint here. If they were to get checkpoint, it wouldn't quite be lead. They would be one point off, but they would be much, much closer to it and getting the checkpoint this early in the game, all but guarantees that they're going to be able to get a second crack at it later. So this is an important defensive moment. And here is how I end up playing it. I'll let it play all the way through. And then I'm going to give you my rationale and my thinking on how it worked out. All right. So I ran in and fed, right? Yes. Kind of. But let's think about what the actual result of that was. So, going back here. Like I mentioned before, we're outnumbered here. And what I anticipate happening here, if the enemy team plays this carefully, is that they paint up, they take over high ground positions, so as soon as that spinner starts moving upward, they're going to use it to get up onto our grates or our snipe area. And that's going to be a big problem for us because all of our defense right now is at ground level. Uh, both Jellyfish and just barely down there. They are at a height disadvantage. The Rainmaker is firing over at them and taking space away. Enemy players are going to be able to shoot at slight range advantage from them from being on top of that ledge. They're also going to be able to back away and use the ledge for cover. And it's a lot more difficult for the defenders to rush at the Rainmaker because it's over the top of that ledge. So their best play is to try and like take the high ground positions, throw bombs, try and keep the area painted, and just hope they can hold out long enough that they get reinforcements. Now, I look at this and I feel like I don't have as much to add if I'm just sitting back here with them. I could probably paint a little bit more, I could probably throw a bunch of bombs, but I'm also worried that I'm going to end up standing on one of their toes, that we're, one of them is going to retreat toward me, and that then we're going to get hit by the same stuff. There is an inkjet that ends up coming online that would have been very dangerous to be grouped up like this with. And another thing that I'm noticing is that we don't have pressure from more than one angle right now. Everyone is looking at the same direction at the Rainmaker. If someone attacks the Rainmaker from the other side, then we have a pinch angle on it, and that gives us a slightly better chance of being able to do something about it. Now, there are a number of different ways that I could do this, and the one that I take is definitely the most aggressive by far. This is probably not the, the very uh, supportive play that I would expect out of an NZAP player, but you know, you, you can take the T-Tech out of my hands, but you can't take the T-Tech out of my heart. So I go off for this right side flank after throwing a bomb in their place to try and stall things just long enough to counteract some of the time that it's going to take me to get into position on the opposite side. When I get here, uh, <laughs> you see me shooting a little bit at the unpaintable wall because I forget that it's unpaintable, uh, and then you'll notice that I hesitate here. The hesitation here is because I know on a top-level competitive team, somebody is already on top of the spinner right here watching me approach from the right because this flank is just so common that you have to expect it. You have to put someone there just in case it's going to come in. They have it painted already, so it wouldn't be very difficult for someone like me to sneak in here. So when I come around here, I'm expecting that if there's someone watching this, I'm already getting pre-fired. And the fact that I'm not makes me understand that, okay, maybe there is someone watching this and they're sharking, but they're sharking really passively. Um, they're also, you know, they probably could have seen that I threw the bomb over there and then not been able to account for me and that would have told them that I was here and then they'd be pre-firing or something, but they're not doing that either. So I think they're just a little bit slow in rotating to this position. So at this point, I commit. Um, I'm past the point of no return at this point. As soon as I get seen, the play is, you know, is going to de develop the way it's going to develop. I don't really have a way out after I do this, but 
I get all the way over here and my two teammates are still alive. And that was something that I was checking to make sure would be the case. If my teammates aren't alive here, then the Rainmaker has a, an easy path to the goal and I'm immediately cutting to the left and trying to cut them off before they get there and trying to trade with them as best I can because we don't want to give up this checkpoint. But since I know that my two teammates are still in place and the opponents are still going to have to play it somewhat slowly, they're going to have to push in you know, with overwhelming force and that takes a little bit of time to get together and to you know, coordinate. I have a little bit of time here where the Rainmaker is going to be relatively still. So I go in and I start shooting at the Rainmaker. Now, obviously, this doesn't end up with me getting the splat on the Rainmaker. I hit a couple of shots, and then they immediately drop off the ledge, and I'm getting shot at by two different people, and it's really hard to kind of aim down over the ledge and hit these shots while my feet are getting painted. So this is not going to result in me splatting the Rainmaker with my main weapon. But there were three players here, one of them holding the Rainmaker and the other two defending it. Let's think about what's going to result from me coming in very conspicuously and trying to cause a commotion here. If the Rainmaker stays where it's at, stays back here with the other two players, it's going to get splatted. And me going down in exchange for the Rainmaker is totally an okay trade. And at this level, people are going to know that. The Rainmaker needs to stay alive here for this to be worth it. Um, and the reason for that is that if I trade the Rainmaker... That's two different people who are go both going to respawn, but the enemy team is slowed down more than my team is because they now have to pop the Rainmaker shield. And we don't care about popping the Rainmaker shield. We can just keep defending. So that buys us time to get our reinforcements back in. Whereas for them, they now have this whole shield to pop and they're down a player to help them pop it. So they're going to have to divert more resources backwards to looking at the Rainmaker shield instead of forwards to looking at the defenders who are trying to get at it. And that radius of control around the Rainmaker is going to break down a little bit when they do that. So this gives us a little bit of time to stall and make it back into play most of the time. Rainmaker knows that they need to stay alive. And the direction that they have to move in order to stay alive here is forward. They can't move anywhere else. They don't have any cover from me unless they drop off this ledge. So that's the play that they have to make based on the positioning that they have here. Now, the other two players, in the meantime, they have as their priority to remove me from play quickly so that I can't trade the Rainmaker here. And so when I get into this position and realize I'm not going to splat the Rainmaker, notice I don't drop down and go after the Rainmaker. Because at this point, there are two people trying to do DPS to me, and I'm only one person trying to do DPS to the Rainmaker whose only job is to run into me. I lose that engagement. The way that I play this better is by backing up. I completely give up on going after the Rainmaker. And I do this because I know that my teammates, my two teammates, are still up directly between the Rainmaker and the goal here. And so what I've done by diving like this is, yes, I go down and I don't get anybody in return, but I get two of the Rainmaker's bodyguards to focus on one of us, which takes away that numbers disadvantage that we're at. We were at a 3v4, but because now two enemy players are dealing with one of me, now in front of us, in front of me here, is a 2v2 situation where I, my two teammates are fighting the duallys here, which are still in the base and are still causing some problems, and the Rainmaker who's out there just completely running for its life. It hasn't had a chance to, you know, take its time and figure out where things are at. It's just making a mad dash for the pedestal because someone spooked it on the back left side and it has to get out of there. So now, even though I accomplished basically nothing individually, my teammates are able to stop the Rainmaker carrier before it gets to the pedestal. And the two bodyguards who were here with the Rainmaker, who would have provided the overwhelming force that they need to get it to that checkpoint end up not being a factor in that play. So ultimately we end up in a 3v3 situation where our teammate has respawned and so now we have three defenders. I'm down, their Rainmaker carrier is down, and the Rainmaker needs to be popped again and get to our pedestal. And these are even numbers with an even number of specials and my teammates did a great job on defense, saved the play, and we maintain the lead here. Now 
one criticism of this play is that it's really important in solo queue to maintain agency over the game, to make it so that you are able to be in control of your character for as much as possible, because if you leave the play up to your randomly decided teammates, then it's a coin flip whether your randomly decided teammates end up being you know, up to the job. It's, you know, basically 50-50. Did you, you know, get a teammate who's going to beat the other side or did you get a teammate who's going to get beat? Um, in this case, my teammates played defense really well. Um, and that was something that I just kind of had to trust them to do. So this probably isn't a super high level solo queue play, but the ultimate goal here and how I came to that decision and how it ends up working out I think should cause us to consider, I think, what it is that we use to evaluate our impact on the game a little bit. Because on the results screen, like I said, this looks like I just go down, you know, it's an extra death next to my name, and it doesn't really show up there in any way. Like, you know, zoned the Rainmaker out so that teammates could get a splat. Like, that's, I guess you could see it in the uh, mini splatling here who ends up being able to shoot the Rainmaker, and they have a plus one that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, but I do think that this sort of a play, especially with a coordinated team, is something that does have a positive impact on games. Um, this is why, for example, the Tetra Duelies are so popular right now, is that they're really good at going in and causing these kinds of commotions, diving into the enemy team like this, and making this sort of thing happen. With the Tetra Duelies, admittedly, I might have been able to get some more picks out of this. And you might say that this isn't really the uh, kind of play that an end zap should be making in this situation, that we have a spammable, spammable bomb, probably would have been the safer bet to stay back and keep throwing that and protect our lives. But hopefully this at least goes to show how this kind of a play can be worthwhile, and to be thinking about that sort of impact that you have, instead of just thinking about raw KA or you know, staying in the predictable positions and doing the predictable things and letting the numbers clash into each other and the coin flips play out the way that they will. Um, there is still some room for tactics in this game, especially on these, Spl these Splatoon 2 maps that still have flank routes. And I think that this was a case where being able to take advantage of this flank route did really have a positive impact on this particular defensive sequence. So let me know what you think in the comments and let me know if there's other kinds of concepts that you'd like me to cover. This is just something that came up in a game that I saw, and I thought I'd go over it because I thought that my rationale for this thinking was kind of interesting and might be illuminating to some aggressive weapon players who might be on, you know, being told they're playing too passively and not really sure how to make a play that's actually going to work um, without just giving up a ton of space and trying to play like a paint support. Thanks for watching.